Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Now, here's Mother Miriam. Good morning, beloved family. How are you doing? I pray you're well. We are well here. We're in the middle of a storm here in Tulsa. I hope it doesn't cut us out electrically. electrically. How do you say that word? But but all is well, beloved. God is on the throne, and uh, we're right in the middle. Uh, Not we, but uh, LifeSite News and Voice of the Family is right in the middle of the Rome Life Forum that... um, ends today, actually, it's been three days, with an array of magnificent speakers, top speakers in the church. Um, uh, Bishop Athanasius Snyder, Cardinal Burke, um, Father Lanzetti, uh, Linus Clovis, um, uh, I I just, uh, John Henry, um, uh, oh, John Henry, Weston of uh, the co-founder of LifeSite News. I'm I'm getting all uh, my memory is not uh, clear on that, but all the talks are online, and you can register if you haven't already. Uh, just go to Rome Life Forum and follow the instructions. You can register. You can still get in. You can listen to the archives. You can listen to all the past talks. Everything is free, and of course, it's online, being live streamed because of the coronavirus. And it's uh, normally it would be expensive, but it's free. And the talks are magnificent. And the theme is um, uh, Fatima and the coronavirus. Uh, it's absolutely outstanding, covering all that's going on today. And uh, the first talk is by um, Cardinal uh, Raymond Burke, uh, who is a top, top canonist of the church and has really brought clarity to the whole um, mess, I'm, I'm trying to think of a better word, um, confusion of churches being closed, communion being denied on the tongue, uh, dispensation being lifted for mass, and what is right, what is not right, uh, what is what cannot be right because it's not of God, all of that. And so I find it um, very peace-giving and life-giving because it's clear whether or not the church is following or the hierarchy or our shepherds are following what is clear and what is right, whether they personally understand it. Uh, I I believe there are a number of shepherds that simply have followed others and and simply don't know. And we say, well, why don't they know? because for all kinds of reasons, all kinds of reasons, we we should know our faith better than we do, and and many of us don't. So, and they they have a greater accountability. We understand that, but the main thing is that we pray that they would hear these messages, that their hearts would be changed, just through knowledge, if nothing else, and they would not uh, want to dare to refuse what what is divine law versus what is man's law. So that is our our prayer for them and for us and for the church. But in the interim, we know that God has allowed this. Uh, Did he bring it on? I I couldn't say he brought it on, but I could certainly say he allowed it. And I do think it's a chastisement and a pre-warning for us to get our lives in order and to give us a picture of what we're going to be without, perhaps one day not too far from now. We need to learn to live uh, without supermarkets, without the faith as we now have it. I think we need all that. And I think this is a um, a preview to that, but also a chastisement, most of all, because nothing is more important than the salvation of souls, including our own. So... um, I think if you go and listen to those messages, it'll bring you great peace. And um, uh, not anger, but peace to know with clarity the truth. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And uh, it does set us free. It sets us free to know. It eliminates confusion. And then we know uh, where where, uh, people... 
uh, faithful, lay faithful shepherds, whoever they are, where they've gone astray, and we can pray for them and um, and and pray that God convert their hearts, but be as as um, uh, how do I say uh, patient um, and compassionate with other hearts as we are with our own. So um, I'm going to turn to the Baltimore Catechism. I'm on Catechism number three. Lesson one on the end of man, and I said a couple of days or yesterday I might have. Uh, I, we chose this because when we go through entire books, very hard for people to follow, and uh, we have breaks at times because of the news, because of holy days. Uh, yesterday was a holy day, uh, the Ascension, and um, holy day of obligation actually, but um, most of the church, at least in the United States, has eliminated. Uh, Ascension Thursday is now uh, Ascension Thursday Sunday. How does that sound? <laughs> Thursday is on Sunday now. And so many of our holy feasts have been transferred to Sunday and they just fade away and people don't even know what they're about and don't keep them. And I, it's a terrible grief, a set of uh, terrible state to me because the faith is being uh, lost and purposely um, I think destroyed when we do those things. Um, so, um, uh, so we're going to go back to what is, and um, the Baltimore Catechism uh, is point by point, so we can just take whatever time we have each day and finish a point. And if we don't return to it the next day, we return to it the day after, and it, and it, it's uh, not a sequence that we must. Uh, follow every single day. So, okay, enough said. Um, because this is our second day on it, um, I'm going, I'm not always going to um, review this, but I'm going to review the beginning of it. First three questions is all we took. And again, we skipped yesterday, so I'll review that today. It's Friday, by the way, which means we are not excused from a Friday um, uh, sacrifice. Um we we are uh, it must be um uh it it had been abstinence from meat and um uh, that changed after Vatican II and i think it changed in a good way uh because many people could not have meat or many people were vegetarians and so there was they said, I'm off the hook there's no sacrifice for me i don't eat meat anyway and Vatican II wanted the lay faithful to to mature some and say that the idea is to enter into the sacrifice of Christ of Christ every Friday, make every Friday a good Friday, not on pain of sin, but um, to sacrifice is on pain of sin. We are not absolved from that. Um, we still need to sacrifice. Um, and again, if it's not meat, the U.S. Uh, bishops have asked that it can, we continue that the sacrifice be meat, to abstain from meat, um, just because of to, to uh, um, for for abortion in this country. But in any case, uh, if we're vegetarian or if we're too young or too old or for other reasons we don't have meat, um, we're on a carnivore diet, whatever that is about. Um, then we can make another sacrifice. I think it ch- should still be meat for the Lamb of God, but we can make another sacrifice. And and I would say the majority of people, when they no longer had to have meat as a sacrifice, just abandoned the sacrifice and thought they were excused, but they're not. So again, there needs to be a sacrifice every single Friday. We're not excused from that. Um, I think the bishops have uh, lifted the um, the requirement of meat but um, but the requirement of a Friday sacrifice has, has not been. Uh, we need to do that. So uh, we need to always join as much as we can uh, uh, in union with the sacrifice of our Lord. And every Friday we should remember that. Okay, Baltimore Catechism. First question of uh, the Catechism number three, what do we mean by the end of man? Um, we had a question yesterday from a lovely woman who had a, a difficult childhood, but a wonderful, she entered the church 20 years ago and has a wonderful family and children and grandchildren and husband and everything's terrific. And all of a sudden she says, I'm on, 
She said, I was on the struggle bus, and I don't know why I'm here. I don't know my purpose. I'm depressed, all of that. Well, uh, people could say, what am, why am I alive? What am I here for? And that's what we mean. What do we mean by the end of man? And the answer is, by the end of man, we mean the purpose for which he was created. Man, mankind, we were created, namely to know, love, and serve God. You see, and we, when we kind of snap ourselves out of our self-consumption um, uh, and, and all of that, we give ourselves away to others, and that is to know, love, and serve God. It brings us out of ourself it, and, and focuses us on the kingdom of God for which we're made very, very healthy to get out of ourselves and not give in to our flesh or the, the, the tactics of the devil who jumps on our weakness. Just say, get thee behind me, Satan, and go give your life away uh, to, to, to people that have suffered as you have or are suffering as you are suffering. It's the greatest, greatest aid to our health. Um, There's the music for our first break, beloved. You're welcome to call in at any time with anything on your heart, Uh, not what we're speaking about, anything that's on your heart. Toll free, 1-877-511-5483 or email at mother at thestationofthecross.com and we'll take your calls after the second break and have a whole half hour to ourselves that way. So we'll be right back. Don't go away. Love learning more about the church, but confused or disheartened by the struggles we are facing today? Follow LifeSite News Catholic on Facebook, Twitter, or sign up for LifeSite Catholic emails and stay up to date on the constant stream of news about the Catholic Church. Our church is in a time of crisis, and we as laity have a responsibility and a duty to educate ourselves and stay true to the faith. LifeSite News Catholic is dedicated to keeping the laity informed and educated. To follow us, go to Facebook or Twitter and search LifeSite News Catholic. As Mother Miriam always says, we must live as if it were true. The Catholic Current on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. These groups are getting all of this money and doing things, I think, that are endangering our sovereignty and endangering our safety. Uh, what is it about the culture that, that needs to be fixed or purified? Well, I mean, it's pretty much everything, you know, when we come down to it. Tune in weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross and iCatholic Radio for The Catholic Current, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. The Terry and Jesse Show, weekdays, 2 p.m. Eastern, on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and heard around the world on the iCatholic Radio app. Hi, this is Terry Barber from The Terry and Jesse Show. Every week we bring you the gospel with clarity and charity. Be sure to tune in each week at 2 p.m. Eastern. We love it when you join the conversation at 888-526-2151. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. I'm thrilled to be with you. And um, we are actually going to go further in, um, where am I now? Uh, hold on, just, and here we are in the Baltimore Catechism number three. So we just answered, what do we mean by the end of man? And by the end of man, we mean the purpose for which he was created, namely to know, love, and serve God. Second, 
How do you know that man was created for God alone? And again, we read these two days ago, so I'm just going to go through them quickly. Uh, The answer, I know that man was created for God alone because everything in the world was created for something more perfect than itself. But there is nothing in the world more perfect than man. Therefore, and you know when we say man, we're talking about mankind. The scriptures say God created man and made him male and female. We're not eliminating woman when we speak of man in a general term. Um, We're speaking of mankind, not... We don't have to say humankind or personkind. Mankind is what the scriptures and uh, our language has always said, and and it's perfectly uh, good. So, um, therefore, man was created for something outside this world. If he, if there's nothing in the world more perfect than man, therefore he was created for something outside this world. And since he was not created for the angels, he must have been created for God. Now, in what respect are all men equal? All men are equal in whatever is necessary for their nature and end. This is very, very important. All men are equal, men and women. All men are equal in whatever is necessary for their end. And what did we say their end was? The end is the purpose for which he was created. That is to know, love, and serve God. So, In what respect are men and women equal? They're equal in their ability to know, love, and serve God. That's it. But let me read the answer that's here. Um, All men are equal in whatever is necessary for their nature and end. They are all composed of a body and soul. They are all created to the image and likeness of God. They are all gifted with understanding and free will. And they have all been created for the same end, God. Now, uh, that's in what respect all are equal. If we're fighting for equality between men and women, that's the equality right there. Um, And the next question, new for us, do not men differ in many things? And again, every time we say men, we mean men and women. And if you say, well, why didn't the scriptures say that? Well, they did. God created, I must repeat this, God created man and made man um, uh, male and female. So the men come under man, women come under man. Men and women, man, <laughs> both under men. Oh, the male and the female is, is summed up as man, mankind. Do not men differ in many things? The answer, men differ in many things, such as learning, wealth, power, etc. But these things belong to the world and not man's nature. He came into this world without them, and he will leave it without them. Only the consequences of good or evil done in this world will accompany men to the next. You see that? Not his learning, not his wealth, not his power, not his status, not his accomplishments, not his failures, zero. Only the consequences of good or evil done in this world will accompany men to the next. Next question. Who made the world? God made the world. That's really simple. Next question. What does world, W-O-R-L-D, mean in this question? Who made the world? What does world mean in this question? World means the universe, that is, the whole creation, all that we now see or may see uh, hereafter. In other words, everything that's been created is the world. Next question, who is God? God is the creator of heaven and earth and of all things. Now, it's simple sentences, and this is what the church in her wisdom, how she taught children for, for a long, long time, 2,000 years. 1,500 of them. And we've pretty much, many of us, stopped using, many people, not necessarily many of us, have ceased using the Baltimore Catechism. And I was listening recently to a program by Dr. Taylor Marshall, and he suggests that this is the best way to learn or relearn our faith and teach it to our children, because children grow up and they don't know the answer to this. Who made the world? They said, well, uh, and they think of all the theories out there, evolution, creation, um, Big Bang, I mean, whatever it is, and they don't have an answer. But if they go through the Baltimore Catechism as children or as adults, 
then they have the answers. Now, if they want to ex- not believe the answers or explore the answers, that's uh, very good, actually. If they want to explore the answer, understand this is good. God says, come, let us reason together. But they have in their heart the answer that God has given. And you say, well, it's the answer the church gave, not God. No, the church gives God's answers. This is the faith once delivered to the saints, established by God. Who made the world? God made the world. And you can ask that to a five-year-old, and if they've been taught at home, uh, they know the answer to that. And if you say, well, what do you mean by that? They may, they may be able to describe it further. They may not say, well, I'm not sure, but that's an honest answer. But they know that God, whoever God is, whatever God is, they can't answer that either. The greatest scholars can't fully answer that. They know the answer in their heart. Next question, what does world mean? Uh, And in this question, the world means the universe. The whole creation, all that we now see or may hereafter see, everything that was ever created, whether we see it or not. Who is God? God is the creator of heaven and earth and of all things. Simple answers, and you say, well, that doesn't cover everything. You're certainly right. A thousand lifetimes would not cover everything. A million eternities would not cover everything because we'll never be God. We'll never know what he knows. We'll know him as we are known, um, uh, the this, this scripture John wrote but uh, in First John, but we will not be God. We will be like him, but we'll never be God. We will always remain the creature. Next question, what is man? Now listen up. <laughs> what is man? And again, man and woman. What is man? Man is a creature composed of body and soul and made to the image and likeness of God. That's what man is. What are you? You are a creature composed of body and soul, made to the image and likeness of God. Next question. Does man, M-A-N, in the catechism, mean all human beings? And the answer is man, in the catechism, means all human beings, either men or women, boys, girls, children. All human beings, absolutely. What is a creature? These questions are terrific. If you say God made man, well, what is what is who is God? Uh, what is a creature? What is man? This is really wonderful. What is a creature? A creature is anything created, whether it has life or not, body or no body. Every being, person or thing, except God Himself, may be called. A creature. That is everything but God himself is called a creature because everything was made, brought into this world by the creator. Next question. Is this likeness in the body or in the soul? And the answer, this likeness is chiefly in the soul. Next question. How is the soul like to God? The soul is like to God because it is a spirit that will never die and has understanding and free will. Now, that's a mouthful for some people. That's the whole answer. But that is a mouthful, and you could take a few years to study that one. How is the soul like to God? The soul is like to God because it is spirit. God is spirit. It is spirit that will never die. God is eternal. He will never die and has understanding and free will. We are made in the likeness of God with understanding and free will. That is uh, the main um, meaning of our being made in the likeness of God. And we are, we are eternal. We, are, we, are not, we don't exist from all eternity as God does. We come into being. We didn't, have, we didn't exist before we were created in our mother's womb. No. We were created by God in our mother's womb, and we came into being, and from that point till, not till the end of time, because time will end and eternity will go on, we will never, ever end. Our life will never end. We spend it in time here on earth. But once we leave the earth through death, uh, for any reason, once we leave the earth, um, we will spend eternity, we will live forever, either with God or without God. That's what heaven and hell is about. 
living with him in eternal bliss, living without him in eternal torture. That's what the scriptures say, and that's what our Lord Jesus speaks of more than any other subject, is the subject of hell and those who will go there because they will not have God. And God respects their free will. Okay. Um, Next question. Is every invisible thing a spirit? And here is the answer. Every spirit is invisible, which means cannot be seen. But every invisible thing is not a spirit. The wind is invisible, but it's not a spirit. Okay, I'll repeat that. Very simple, but it's it's sometimes it's, uh, you, you say, well, look at that. I never thought of that. Of course the wind is not a spirit, see? And it, these simple, simple answers that really give us a, a wealth of knowledge and understanding and peace because the truth sets us free. So the question is, is every invisible thing a spirit? And the answer is, Every spirit is invisible, which means it cannot be seen. But every invisible thing is not a spirit. The wind is invisible, and it is not a spirit. Next question. Has spirit any other quality? And the answer is, a spirit is also indivisible. That is, it cannot be divided into parts as we divide material things into parts. Okay, we can divide our body into parts, it's material, but our spirit cannot be divided. What do the words will never die mean? Quote, will never die, end quote. What do those words mean? By the words will never die, W-I-L-L, will never die, we mean that the soul, once, when one's created, will never cease to exist, whatever be its condition in the next world. Hence, we say the soul is immortal or gifted with immortality, which we said just a couple of minutes ago. So we're going to end right there, um, and we're going to go to our break. And when we come back from our break, we'll have a whole half hour to ourselves for questions and uh, texts, uh, emails, um, you're welcome to call in toll-free or text at one 511 5483 or email at mother at thestationofthecross.com. We'll be right back. Don't go away. LifeSite News is an international news agency devoted to defending life and family and restoring Christian culture. We aim to educate and activate our readers with the information they need to fight the most crucial battles of our day in their churches, workplaces, and families. Our motto is Caritas in Veritate, love in truth. We firmly believe that promoting the truth is an act of love, however hard it is to hear. Over the last 20 years, we have built a reputation for uncompromising reporting, no matter the cost. LifeSite News is by far the most popular pro-life website on the internet, with over 40 million unique users every year and growing. Check us out at LifeSiteNews.com. Join us here on the Station of the Cross for the Liturgy of the Hours at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern with the Office of Readings read at 3 o'clock. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus tells us, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The Liturgy of the Hours is also known as the Divine Office and is the daily prayer of the Church. So you know you'll be uniting your prayer with priests, religious, and laity throughout the world. It's comprised of small reflections, readings from sacred scripture, and writings from saints and theologians. To learn more about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. 
That's thestationofthecross.com. Pray with us each day at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. I'm thrilled to be with you and uh, to take your calls, your emails, your texts. We don't always have the answer. We do our best, and then we have uh, resources we could uh, refer you to uh, if we don't have an answer or just uh, too weak an answer. So, um, again, our toll-free number and our lines are right wide open right now. And, again, the, um, the heart of the matter is the matter of your heart. So whatever's on your heart is the issue, not, not what we're speaking about. So... Go ahead and call in with anything, including what we're speaking about. Um, toll free one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three, or email at mother at the station of the cross dot com. We have an email from Tobias, and Tobias says, "Good morning, mother. I thank God for your wonderful program. Thank you, Tobias. I used to believe very strongly in evolution and the thirteen point seven billion year old universe." <clears throat> However, I am a recent revert, and I have begun deeply researching the other side of the story that our Catholic faith requires us to believe, that the Bible is entirely, literally true and inerrant. My trouble is that my wife of one year does not share my newfound belief in this Catholic truth. We are about to have our first child and will probably be homeschooling. Good. How and when should I bring up the history of creation to my wife, who is highly intelligent and will probably require a great deal of convincing, thankfully yours, Tobias. Tobias, I have good news for you. The Church teaches uh, both creation and evolution. It's not a definitive statement on evolution, but one can believe both. Basically... um, Uh, The Church does not determine that the universe is so many billion years old, but it allows for that. What it does not allow for is the um, um, unintelligible link or or leap between animal and human person with a soul uh, and and intelligence uh, and will. Um, animals have souls, but they have different souls uh, than human beings. So whatever we believe, whether you whether one keeps their um, theory of a 13.7 billion year old universe, um, what they must believe is that God created Adam and Eve and put in them uh, a living, made them a living being, put in Adam and Eve a living soul created by God, and they became men man and woman. So man and woman could have evolved physically, but they could not have evolved from a physical being to a uh, a being made in the image and likeness of God with understanding and will. So that God has done on the spot. So we could say that the world existed for billions of years, but man, mankind, uh, let's just say through Adam and Eve, uh, God poured his spirit uh, into them at a certain point, and man was created. So uh, you can you can have both, but you you just need to understand and help your wife understand that um, the soul of a human being, intelligence and will, does not evolve. We are made in the image of God, um, and that happens at a single moment when God took a creature and poured His soul into that creature. Um, you, you have a wonderful explanation on, on the website of catholic.com, and it's the history of the, um, the church's understanding of evolution. Um, it, it's evolution and the magisterium. You don't have to eliminate one for the other. Um, it takes in Galileo. It takes in the development of the church's understanding, the teaching of Pius XII, 
um, Humanae Generis, um, uh, teaching of John Paul II, and it's very, very helpful. And the Catechism includes in the Scriptures evolution and the deposit of faith. I, I would read this to you, but it's it's quite long, um, and it's I think it's going to be very helpful. So look up Catholic.com, Catholic Answers, Catholic.com, and just scroll down and click on the article by Jimmy Aiken, Evolution and the Magisterium. Uh, Jimmy's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And uh, the reason I know he is so brilliant is because he has the ability to present things in in such a way that a child can understand them. And you have to be very brilliant to not be complicated. And, and Jimmy is, has a gift of explaining things simply and clearly. And this is not written for a child. It's written for adults. But it's a very good article. So... Um, uh, I, th- I, th- I hope that I hope that helps Tobias, and you don't have to come against your wife. It, she doesn't have to give up her understanding of of evolution, but she can add the fact that God did something very special in pouring His life into uh, into man. Um, and you say she's very intelligent. She'll probably appreciate that article on Catholic.com. And there shouldn't be any conflict in homeschooling your children. We have uh, a, um, I don't know what, um, oh, I think it means somebody called in not on the line from Paul. Um, and uh, he, he left a message. Mother, you stated last Monday that a priest cannot refuse someone the right to Holy Communion. I'm wondering if that is cited in canon law anywhere. He had heard it from other sources, too. I'd have to look up canon. I think so. Look up canon law made easy on the web. I think you'll find it there, a website by a wonderful canonist, wonderful canon lawyer, canon law made easy. I think you'll find it there. Um, But it's not that a priest cannot refuse uh, someone the right to Holy Communion. Uh, He doesn't have the right to do that. If he, ref- but he, you know, we could say we don't have the right. We cannot murder someone. We cannot. We don't have the right to murder. It's a grave sin. Well, the fact is, people go against what is right. Um, they go against divine law, so they can. If a uh, so, a priest can uh, refuse someone holy. He'll be in sin, but he can refuse them. Uh, he can sin. He can turn from God's law. If he doesn't know he's turning from God's law, that's a great fault, but um, the, he's less accountable. But he can certain many priests are refusing communion and many refusing communion on the tongue. And so they're wrong. Uh, they cannot do that morally, but they're doing it uh, in ignorance, I would say, or just not caring. I, I don't know. I can't judge motives. Um, so again... Uh, no one has the right, uh, Cardinal Burke, uh, Cardinal Seurat, Cardinal Mueller, um, Bishop Athanasius Snyder, um, Cardinal Brandmuller. I'm thinking of others that, that have said so. Um, I don't know that I could quote Cardinal Brandmuller on this, but I'm, I'm picking out very holy Orthodox men of God in the church. Um, and so, um, Again, uh, if you find it on Canon Law, and if you find some good articles on uh, on the web, and you're going to find them on LifeSite News for the most part, um, then you can print them out, and in, in charity, with a good, humble spirit of a sheep, print them out and give them to your pastor. And if he says, I'm not interested in this, well, then you have the answer from him. Um, We have a question from Annie that she left on Facebook. Dear Mother Miriam, I'm very disturbed to learn from a friend of mine who is facing difficulties in life that she requests her dead family members to pray for her. Previously, she told me she was praying to them, and I told her that it is a sin that we should pray to God alone. Now she tells me, that she requests her dead family members to pray for her. Is this a demonic practice? Please advise. Thank you. Annie, um, you're either not Catholic, because what your friend is practicing and doing is, is Catholic faith. It's the faith God has given us. So 
either you're not Catholic, you're Protestant, and that's why you're asking these questions, or um, or you're Catholic and you don't know the Catholic faith. Um, but yes, this is all Catholic teaching. Uh, Apostle Paul says we ought to pray for all men everywhere, all men everywhere, and we ought to pray for one another. And he says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and there's no one more righteous than somebody that's in heaven. Um, if they're in heaven. We don't always know they're in heaven, but they may be on their way to heaven, which is purgatory. Purgatory is not a second chance. Purgatory is what Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6. I'm convinced that he uh, who began, God, who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And um, when we leave this earth, we're not always um, perfected. We are forgiven, but that doesn't mean we're totally free from sin, even though we're forgiven. And purgatory is the last stage of sanctification before we see the Lord. It's a gift from God. And only people on their way to heaven have the gift of going through purgatory to be finally cleaned up, that is. And we know that people in purgatory are on the way to heaven, and we also know that it's a passive state. They cannot pray for themselves. We on earth can pray for them. They can pray for us. Now they're free. They're free in purgatory from the power of sin. They're free from the presence of sin. Now they, they're closer to God more than they've ever been in their life. Now they see sin more clearly than they ever have, and they can pray for us. Um, and they see their own sin, but they can do nothing about it. So it's up to us to pray for them. Um, so they're dead physically, but as we said earlier, even in the going through the catechism, we never die. Our souls are immortal. We live forever. We don't have physical bodies in purgatory, and we won't have them until the, um, until the general um, uh, resurrection. But, uh, but we have our spirit. We, are, we will be united with our bodies. But um, we are immortal souls. And so those in purgatory, hell purgatory in heaven. Uh, those that are um, suffering in purgatory, um, those that, and, and they also, if the church suffering is in purgatory, uh, the church condemned is in hell. And uh, their state will not change. The souls in purgatory who are suffering will one day, through our prayers and sacrifices, be freed and be in the presence of God and, um, and will be able to even more so, uh, and with total bliss, be able to pray for us. So yes, the communion of saints and the Protestant reformers believe this. Uh, Wesley wrote the song, um, uh, the, church is, the church is one foundation. And the third verse says, but we, are, we on earth have union with God the three in one and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. We have communion for those who have gone before us to God. We do. That's when our communion will be made more perfect. Um, it never stops. The, the only difference is they are now with God and they are outside of space and time. But the ability to communicate is, is even better now. It's more clear because sin and distortion is not in their way as it is in our way. So if we want the most effective prayers that we could get, we should pray to the saints in heaven. We pray to the saints in heaven as opposed we could pray to the saints on earth um, because we are saints. Apostle Paul writes to the saints who are in Rome, who are in Philippi. That is those set apart for God. And that's what a Christian is, consecrated to God, set apart to be in the world and not of it. And so... Um, I hope that helps. Uh, Annie, there's a fantastic book that will help you, and it helped me very much on my journey into the church. It's written by Patrick Madrid, and it's called Any Friend of God's, G-O-D apostrophe S. Any Friend of God's is a Friend of Mine. Any Friend of God's is a Friend of Mine. I would really suggest you get a hold of that. It's, it's not large, and it deals with the purgatory and the communion of saints in a very clear and fully scriptural manner. There's the music for our second break, beloved. We'll be right back 
to take your calls, your emails. It'll be our last segment of this program and for the week because we have the weekend coming up. So feel free to call in with anything on your heart. Toll free 1-877-511-5483. We'll be right back. We stand at a crossroads in history. We can stand up for life, family, and a Christian culture, or we can stand idly by while the fabric of society becomes fundamentally anti-life, anti-family, and anti-Christian, slowly leading to its own demise. LifeSite News is the leading defender of life, family, and Christian culture. Through our news reporting, we seek to educate readers with information and zeal. They need to fight the most crucial battles of our day, and we need your help to continue that mission. You can support LifeSite News by following our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Another way to support LifeSite is to prayerfully consider becoming a Sustain Life monthly donor to help us continue to save lives in the culture. To donate, visit give.lifesitenews.com forward slash sustain life. Our staff of over 40 and millions of future generations Thank you for helping to save the culture. Put your pro-life convictions into action and stand out for life every Saturday morning, wherever you may be. We'll be broadcasting live 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern, hosted by myself, Jim Havens, and Father Stephen Imbarato as we stand out live on location. But this is more than a broadcast. It's a call to action. Grab a pro-life sign and publicly take a stand outside of a local abortion center or any high traffic area like an exit ramp, overpass, or street corner. And as you do, listen to the Stand Out for Life broadcast. If you're in the Eastern time zone, stand out from 9 to 10 a.m. and listen live. But if you're in a different time zone, the broadcast is easily available to you via podcast shortly after it airs on the iCatholic Radio app. So you can stand out and listen anytime that is most convenient for you. The main thing is that we all take at least an hour to stand out for life in public witness every Saturday, even if it's just sitting on the front porch holding a pro-life sign. Whatever you can do, we all must take a part in public witness for the end of abortion. God bless you. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. It's our last segment. We've got a good 10 minutes before us, and the lines are open. You're welcome to call in with anything on your heart, 1-877-511-5483. We're going to take a question by Kelly, um, who has a question on Facebook, and says, Mother Miriam, please help. I am so distraught and angry. Our entire diocese is violating liturgical law and forcing communion in the hand. They are indeed violating a liturgical law by forcing communion in the hand. I do not know if I have the strength to go to Mass and not be filled with hatred for the clergy. Now, that's, that would be uh, sinful, beloved. Um, you can f- be filled with hatred, hatred for the, the sin committed, but not the sinner. That's always the case. If God were filled with hatred for us, when we sinned, when we were wrong, regardless of why, uh, we would die on the spot. We couldn't handle it. God loves the sinner. He hates the sin. We must do that. Otherwise, we are more guilty than the priest. We cannot hate the clergy. We can be upset. We can be um, angry at the sin. But to hate the clergy shows something wrong with us more than them. Kelly says, I am trying too hard to, I am trying so hard to deal with this, but it has caused so much anxiety. What do you suggest I do and say? I thought I would go to Mass, attempt to receive on the tongue, and if denied, simply walk away and then speak with the priest after. I, I'm going to assure you it will not help. I'm going to assure you it will not help. You'll make a scene, the priest will be upset with you, and he's not going to, um, he's not going to change. Uh, I don't know why he's doing it. He may be obeying his bishop, which in this case he should not. Uh, I'm repeating the words of of uh, Bishop Athanasius Snyder. Uh, 
uh, no one should refuse communion on the tongue, but he might do it for fear. He might uh, do it for other reasons. Um, and uh, Kelly says, I'm afraid my words following Mass will not be kind. Well, you'd also be wrong in that. It is all so difficult. It is so difficult to deal with someone that is forcing me to defile our Lord. I have lost so much sleep over this and cried so many tears. Kelly, no one will ever force you to defile our Lord. No one will ever force you to defile God. No one. What is your choice? Your choice is simply not to go to Mass. That's the choice we make here. I will not go to Mass and receive communion in the hand. I will not defile our Lord. And I'm not going to go to church and make a scene or try to have a meeting with the priest and, and, and have things blow up. I, I'm simply not going to do that. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to love our Lord. And I'm going to have a spiritual communion. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what I would suggest you do. Everyone's free to do what they want. You're free to receive communion in the hand if you want. But I, I, I have said before, I believe if communion in the hand never, if the debauchery, if the degradation, the loss of respect for God had never taken place, we would never have what's going on now. We would not. It's the loss of faith and honor and respect. That's it. That's it. So, um, I would listen to Cardinal Burke's talk um, on Rome Life Forum, so you you have that clarity from a top canon lawyer of the Church uh, to say that uh, communion uh, on the tongue cannot be forbidden. I mean, that's not news, but he's clarifying it. Uh, Priests cannot wear latex gloves and serve communion on a tray or in baggies or in matchboxes or in other things that are being done. It's a complete debauchery. It cannot be done. Um, I mean, again, peace, people can sin, but it's, it's not right, and we should never receive communion in any other way than from a priest, not with gloves, but with his hands on our tongue. It's the only respect for God. We're treating God like an object. Um, it, it's really awful. So what I would do is find this on the Internet. I think Cardinal Burks uh, and the other uh, speakers at the Rome Life Forum, I think their whole talks will be printed on um, uh, Voice of the Family Life Site and probably on Life Site News. But Life Site News and Voice of the Family it, uh, jointly are putting on this Rome Life Forum. It's being live streamed. The talks are already on um, uh, on the internet. Uh, and if the the printed version is not up, it will be. It will be soon. So um, I would bring him a, a newspaper, not a paper, a, a newspaper, a, a printed article, and say, uh, "Dear Father, uh, I've, I've highlighted a section that I I beg you to read that section, and um, hopefully uh, that God will change your heart and your mind." And then the priest. Uh, has to decide what he's going to do in the face of his own bishop. Maybe, hopefully, give the article to his bishop and not defy God's law. Um, because the bishops have no power to do what they're doing. but They're taking the power, but they don't, they don't have it from God. So, um, Kelly, until then, I would stay home and receive communion on the tongue. Uh, uh, some bishops uh, have said... Uh, not deny communion on the tongue. Uh, they've said you can take communion on the tongue, but we ask you in charity to receive communion on the hand. Well, um, we're not partaking in those masses either because we'll cause a scene and, and we'll give a clear message that we're not, that we don't act in charity. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So it's a terrible thing to put on people. You can receive on the tongue, but in in charity you should not. That's a terrible thing. We're talking about God, not pleasing people. So in those instances, we stay away as well. It's very, very difficult. So don't stay home and be angry. Stay home, uh, give your priest and or your bishop what is written, uh, canon law, and then... um, and just say you, you're really forcing us to stay home uh, and, and, and continue spiritual communion. People have lived with that for years in communistic countries where they cannot have the Eucharist. Um, 
And so we haven't had that suffering, and, and we have it now. But better to stay home and receive communion in prayer with a, with a good heart than go to Mass and go to church and, and hate the priest and have with an angry heart uh, and not receive communion or receive communion or feel that you're defiling God. Never, ever do that. Never, ever. No one will ever force you to defile God. They will not. They will not. Unless they open your mouth and put our Lord in and close your mouth. And all, it's terrible. The, to think of it as off is just beyond imagining. But even then, you are not defiling God. He is being defiled, but not by you. Okay. So um, I know it's very difficult Um Here's a, a quick question from Rebecca on Facebook. I'm struggling to just stop and pray. Is it okay that I pray all day while I'm on the go? It's 100% okay. Apostle Paul says pray without ceasing. Pray all day. Thank God for the parking spot. Thank him for the food in the store. Thank him for life. Thank him that you have the time to do these things. Thank him for everything. That's terrific. Absolutely, Rebecca. But if you say you have no time to stop and pray... Then I would stop and pray. I would pass a church. If it's open, go in. Five minutes. There's a story about a man named Johnny. That's what he did every day. Five minutes. He'd sit in the back of the church and he'd say, Hi, Lord, it's Johnny. And that's it, five minutes every day. And one day when he was in the hospital um, and he was suffering and everyone heard on the loudspeaker throughout the hospital, Hi, Johnny, it's God. See, I get chills every time I tell that story. It's miraculous. So yes, five minutes, stop and say hello to God, and then just keep him in your heart all day. Perfectly fine. And you're not in sin if you don't make the five-minute stop, but I think it'll be very wonderful for you. There's the music, beloved, to the end of the program. Have a blessed, blessed weekend and a good celebration of Ascension on Sunday, if that's what it is for you. And we'll be back with you on Monday. God bless you.